Good afternoon. Let me introduce the people who are with us here today. For those of you who don't know who someone is, to my far right, Dr. Jim Malatris, PhD doctor. To my immediate right, Michaela Kennedy Cuomo, related to me, daughter, third of three, only by age order. There is no order besides age, no preference, no degree of love, no estimate of any ability, just all equal within my eyes. To my left, Melissa DeRosa, Secretary to the Governor. To her left, Dr. Howard Zucker. Uh, to his left, Robert Mejica, Budget Director. Thank you for being here today. Today is day 71 with a question mark. The number of hospitalizations today, down. Great news. Number of intubations down, that's great news. The new COVID cases, which is a different problem than the number of people who are in hospitals. This is how many new cases are showing up every day, um, which has been uh, still very high, is down to 521, and that is down. 521 takes us right back to where we started this hellish journey, right? Uh, March 20th is when we did the close down order. And where we are today is basically, with the number of new cases, is basically right where we were when we started. So uh, it has been a painful period of time between March 20th and May 9th. The optimist would say yes, but it's only March to 20 to May 9th. Uh, the pessimist would say, but a lot of pain, high cost, loss of life. Uh, the realist would be somewhere in the middle. But all of this work, all of this progress of turning that tide, of uh, reducing the rate of infection, that's all thanks to New Yorkers and what New Yorkers did. Uh, number of deaths, 207, still uh, terribly high, but uh, better. The number of deaths, 207, takes us back to almost where we started, about a week in, uh, as the number of deaths started to increase. You could see early in March, 27 deaths, then how quickly it went up. 38, 42, 56, 76, 101, 130, 207. Uh, so just to give you a perspective of uh, where we are today versus where we were. Uh, one of our top priorities is protecting people in nursing homes and seniors. This is where this virus uh, feeds. It's where this virus started, uh, when it started in the state of Washington. We have implemented many safety measures, many of which have been uh, difficult to implement, but we did for health reasons. Restricting visitation, except for end of life visits. Uh, this is a tough policy, and uh, I had serious qualms about it, to tell you the truth. Uh, but the uh, health officials were right. Yes, you want visitation, no, you don't want to walk a virus into a nursing home that could kill the person you're going to visit. Uh, PPE requirements, all staff have to be checked going to a nursing home every 12 hours. Uh, all facilities must notify families within 24 hours, separate facilities, uh, residents from staff in the event of an outbreak. We provided them with millions of pieces of PPE equipment. Uh, this is a national problem, right? Uh, nursing homes uh, generally all across the country have seen the COVID virus take a high toll. New York has one of the highest populations of nursing home residents of any state in the country, over 100,000 residents. Uh, but New York's percentage of deaths in nursing homes is the 34th highest of any state. So if you look at the states and the percentages of people who died 
in nursing homes as a percentage of that death, uh, New York is number 34. Uh, so none of this is good news, but just to give you a context of what people are looking at, this virus uh, uses nursing homes. They are ground zero. They're the vulnerable population in the vulnerable location, right? It's a congregation of vulnerable people. Today we're taking additional steps to protect seniors in nursing homes. Uh, first, I want people to understand how a nursing home operates vis-a-vis -vis the state. The most vulnerable population deserves the highest level of care, right? So the rule is very simple. If a nursing home cannot provide care for a person and provide the appropriate level of care for any reason, they must transfer the person out of the facility. If they can't find another facility, they call the State Department of Health. So what does this mean? If they don't have enough staff, if they don't have enough PPE, if their facility doesn't allow for isolation or quarantine, whatever it is, if they cannot provide the proper care, they must, they must transfer the resident, period. Uh, if they have a COVID positive person and they can't treat a COVID positive person, they must transfer the person who called the State Department of Health and the State Department of Health uh, will uh, transfer that person. All nursing home staff must now be tested twice a week. Uh, that's not just a temperature check, that is a diagnostic test. We have the tests available. We have brought them online. The state has more testing capacity than any state in the country. They have to test their staff twice a week. That is a rule. It's not a, uh, I'd appreciate it if you did. Hospitals going forward cannot discharge a patient to a nursing home unless the patient tests negative for COVID-19. So we're just not going to send a person who is positive uh, to a nursing home after a hospital visit, period. Remember, and I want the nursing home operators to understand this, we have alternative facilities for nursing home patients, COVID or non-COVID. Remember what we did here. We created 40,000 hospital beds because we had to. We had a 50,000 bed capacity system. The early projections were we would need 110,000 beds, 140,000 beds. We created 40,000 additional beds, minimum. So we have beds available. We also set up COVID-only facilities. So we have available COVID-only facilities that could accept nursing home residents. Uh, we're not reducing the number of hospital beds that we have available. We've always had more hospital beds available than we've used, always. There has not been a day that we didn't have more beds available than we've used. So if a nursing home cannot take care of, of a person, we have facilities that can. Uh, and I understand uh, the nursing home's perspective, but if they cannot provide the appropriate care, they have to call the Department of Health and let's get that resident into an appropriate facility. Uh, I can't be more direct about that. We have available COVID-only facilities uh, upstate as well as downstate. So we have the facilities available. If there's any issue, the resident must be referred to the Department of Health, which will find alternative care. If a nursing home operator does not follow these procedures, they will lose their license. Well, that's harsh. No, harsh is having a nursing home resident who doesn't get the appropriate care. That's what's harsh. 
having someone's parent or mother or brother in a situation where they're in a facility, they can't even get a visitor, they're isolated, they feel alone, and they're not getting the appropriate care. That is what is harsh. And if that's what happens, then that facility operator should lose their license. Uh, I, do, I have no problem with that. I was the attorney general. I did investigations of nursing homes. I have tremendous respect for what they do. But this is the essence of their responsibility and obligation. Uh, again, we have the facilities. We have the beds. Uh, it's not like a situation where there are no options. We have options, and we want to use them. So if there's any reason why you can't provide appropriate care, let us know, and we will put them in a facility uh, that has it. Um, also, this is an issue that people need to be aware of. New York State is investigating 85 cases of a COVID-related illness in children, mostly toddler to elementary schools. It's symptoms similar to Kawasaki disease, what they call Kawasaki disease or toxic shock-like syndrome. This does not present as a normal COVID case. COVID cases tend to be respiratory. This it presents as an inflammation of the blood vessels, sometimes inflammation of the heart. Uh, it's possible that these cases were coming in and were not diagnosed as related to COVID because they don't appear as COVID. But uh, it is a situation that has taken the lives of three New Yorkers. There are additional, two additional deaths that are currently under investigation. Uh, as possibly uh, related to this same situation. The New York State Department of Health is going to notify all the other state departments of health. Uh, every state has a Department of Health. They will notify their counterparts in the other states to put them on notice of this. Again, we've recently found this and are investigating it, but it may be possible uh, and it may even be probable that this is a situation that exists in other states and we want to make sure that uh, they are aware, are aware of it. Uh, New York State Department of Health is also actively pursuing a new drug th therapy. Uh, remdesivir has been shown to have some positive effect and um, we're desperately looking for a treatment for this virus. Uh, so the CDC has uh, started tests on this drug, and uh, New York State is working with HHS, uh, Health and Human Services, on the federal side, administering it to 2,900 people at uh, 15 hospitals. And we're looking for more doses to start with an additional 500 people. This week is May 15th. May 15th, the uh, pause order, the close down order, uh, expires. We're looking region to region across the state as to where it would be appropriate to reopen. Uh, this state, we have a clear, uniform set of criteria. It's the same all across the state. It's all science-based. It's all data-based. And we'll look at those numbers. We'll look at those data points to see where it's safe to open. Uh, Local governments should start to look at two things, citizens also. Of those factors that we look at, many factors adjust uh, the rate of spread of the infection, and they're just purely linked to the rate of spread of the infection. Second set of factors looks to the capacity of local government. Do they have enough hospital beds open in case that infection rate goes up? Do they have the testing, tracing, isolation that we've all been talking about for weeks and weeks and weeks? Do they have that operation in place? And do they have a compliance function in place where when we say manufacturing businesses can open but people must be six feet apart, that they can actually monitor uh, those businesses to make sure there's compliance? So uh, one factor one uh, are just the numbers, infection rate, et cetera. Uh, and everybody knows what that is uh, in different parts across the state. Factor two is what local governments have to do 
to be ready and working together with their counterparts in that region. And we'll be speaking to this more tomorrow because May 15th uh, comes at the end of the week. Uh, also, this week, uh, Washington is going to be considering additional legislation. That is essential to what we're all trying to accomplish here. The president has make it, made it clear that the reopening is up to the states, is up to the governors, and uh, I've been working with governors all across the country, and by and large, the people believe the governors are doing what they need to do. But you can't ask someone to do that which they cannot do, right? You can't ask someone to do something that is beyond their capacity, beyond their limits. Uh, we can handle the reopening, but every state, almost every state, has a significant financial problem because of the loss of revenue due to the economy. Just think of how a state works. You close down businesses, their income drops, they're not paying an income tax, the state's revenue drop proportionately. And that's what has happened. You look at uh, our economy was doing great, really great in this state. Uh, but then comes the COVID virus and the impact on our financial plan is about $61 billion. We then have to pay for all of this COVID related work, all this hospital work and testing and everything that's going on that's about another $5 billion per year. We then have essential state agencies that are operating that also have taken a tremendous financial loss. The MTA operates the subways and buses, uh, collects revenue from tolls when people go over bridges or tunnels or through tunnels. Yeah, but ridership is down 92 percent. Uh, and cars aren't driving and they're not paying their tolls. Tremendous revenue loss at the MTA. Port Authority, tremendous revenue loss at airports. Uh, so uh, the economic impact is beyond anything that any state can d deal with. If the federal government doesn't help the states, then you're forcing the states to cut funding and the places where the state normally funds will suffer. If they force me to cut funding, I have to reduce the funding to schools, to local governments, and to hospitals. Why would you ever want to reduce funding to these essential agencies at this time, right? Uh, and why would you make me allocate pain among schools, hospitals, and local governments. It makes no sense at all. New York alone would need about $35 billion uh, this year uh, just to compensate for the total amount of losses. And when you look at Washington, what Washington has done in the past, in the past legislation they've passed, when I say they treat it like pork barrel, why? Uh, I was in Washington for eight years in the Clinton administration. Everything becomes a political game. Every piece of legislation becomes a political game. So when they passed the past legislation, the money they sent to states was supposed to be for COVID. The whole exercise was this was to compensate for uh, what happened during the COVID virus. They just played politics and everybody put money in for their home state. So when you look at what they actually accomplished, states like Alaska got like uh, 100 times what New York got for funding, right? We got about $23,000 for every COVID case. But states that didn't have many COVID cases also received a tremendous amount of funding. Uh, our friends in Kentucky, $337,000 for every COVID case. Yeah. We got $23,000. So uh, it's, what they've done in the past made no sense. Also, what they've done in the past is what they always, uh, it seems, wind up doing. They bailed out corporate America. That's what they did. You look at the past legislation. They bailed out corporate America. This legislation, this week, going forward, let them fund working Americans, because that's the need. You look at the past legislation. 
They funded hotels, restaurants, airlines, big corporations, public companies. Now it turns out they funded a tax break for millionaires. In the COVID response legislation, that's what they did. Yeah, and they didn't fund state and local governments. So who do state and local governments fund? I fund police, firefighters, nurses, school teachers, and food banks. You took care of corporate America, and I don't even want to go through that, but now you're going to starve police and fire and hospitals and schools? Everybody applauds the healthcare workers, but now you don't want to provide any funding. Separate, last point on Washington. Don't make the same mistake twice. Don't do what this nation did after the 2007-2008 uh, mortgage crisis bailout, where the government bailed out all these bankers and corporations that made a fortune running a mortgage scam. And then when the mortgage scam collapsed and the banks were going to go bankrupt, then the taxpayers had to come in and fund the banks. How does this make sense? The banks make all the profit on the way up. They then get into trouble on the mortgage fraud. And we have to bail them out. And who's going to bail them out? The taxpayers are going to bail them out. No. It's not that they reap all the profits on the way up and then the taxpayers provide a golden parachute on the way down. Uh, that has to stop. There should be no subsidy for any corporation that lays off employees, period. Because I'll tell you what's going to happen. You will see corporations using this pandemic to lay off workers. That's what you will see because they're already saying it to the market analysts. We're going to get lean during this period. We're going to right size during this period. What does that mean? It means they're not going to rehire the same number of employees, so they're going to boost their corporate profits by reducing the number of employees. That's what it means. That's what it means. Government should not subsidize their reduction of employees, and then when they reduce employees, government is supposed to now subsidize those employees, unemployment insurance, et cetera. We did it once, we can't do it again. Here's my suggestion to my colleagues in Washington. The Americans First law. If a corporation does not rehire the same number of employees, no government money. All the billions that they just gave out, if you don't rehire the same number of employees you had pre-pandemic, you have to return those funds. We're not going to subsidize you to lay off workers. If you can lay off workers and you're saving money by laying off workers, you don't need the American taxpayer to subsidize you. Otherwise, you will never get those employment numbers back because that's what's going to happen all across the country. And we keep going because we are New York tough, we are smart, you're united, disciplined, and we are loving. Every time I say we are loving, I think people must think that is such a strange word for a government official to be talking about, that we are loving. You never hear a government talking about loving. You never hear a lot of people talk about loving or love. But at this time, where we are all going through so much pain and so much stress and so much anxiety, and we're at a place where we've never been before, it's probably the one thing we need more than anything else. And it's not easy to talk about love. That's why I put it with New York tough. It's not easy to talk about love. I need love to show that vulnerability. It's hard to do that. That's why in some ways you have to be tough to be able to talk about love. But we all need it now because this is hard on everyone. It is hard, I don't care who you are. You can be the governor of the state, a healthcare worker, a public employee, 
a daughter of a governor, a son. Of, it is hard on everyone. And love is the one thing that can make everything better and the one thing we need. When I said today is day 71 with a question mark, because today is not really just day 71. Today is Mother's Day. And that dwarfs all else, day 71, day 70, day 69. It's Mother's Day. And for me, you want to talk about love. The personification for, of love for me has always been my mother. Uh, my father was loving in his way, but he was not uh, warm and cuddly kind of loving. My mother has just always been pure love. Just pure sweetness, pure goodness, pure affirmation, uh, unconditional love. Whatever you did, however stupid I was, and I can be pretty stupid, uh, just that total love of a mother. Uh, so today, more than anything else, mothers are special, special every day, but how about going through this? Uh, talking about nursing homes, you have mothers in nursing homes, families can't get to see them. Mothers have been doing double duty, stuck at home, uh, dealing with all that stress, all that situation. Mothers who have lost mothers, mothers who we have lost during this uh, hellacious period where so many people have lost their parents. So today is Mother's Day, first and foremost. Uh, and Today is about love and showing love and expressing it and appreciation for our mothers. And my mother, who I cannot see today because I am in a position where I am exposed to too many people. And if I go see my mother, Dr. Zucker, blame Dr. Zucker, the health commissioner says it would be risky for me to see my mother because I want to make sure that I don't infect her with anything. She's stronger than I am, and she's smarter than I am, but I just want to make sure that we don't do that. But I get to say uh, Happy Mother's Day to my mother with my daughters. They're all here through one means or the other, whatever this is, Zoom this, Zoom that. Happy Mother's Day to you, Mom. I miss you. I love you so, so much. I wish I could be with you, but I can't be, but I can't be because I love you. That's why I can't be with you, because I love you. But I know Maria is well, taking good care too. of you. I miss you, too, a lot, and your beautiful daughters. So Happy Mother's Day, Grandma. Thank you. Thank you, Cara. You have Cara there. Cara's with Mariah. Mariah, you want to say Happy Mother's Day, Grandmother's Day? Well, yes, Happy Mother's Day, Grandma. I just Thank was you, thinking Jesus. today about this story that I love hearing you tell about how you met the Pope and how he looked you in the <laughs> eye, put your hands in his, and he said La Familia. I think he really captured your spirit. Thank you so much for teaching us what the meaning of family is, both from our own little brood to the family of New York. I love you. That's and, right. And Thank I have you. very little said. And Thank I have you. and I have Michaela here with me. Hi, Grandma. Happy Mother's Day. Hi. We Hi, are. You're, in, you're up at the Capitol. Yes. She, but I'm so glad to see your face. We're so grateful to have such a caring grandma. Thank you. And one who was great mother and role model to our dad and aunts and uncles and such a great mother to so many children beyond our family. So thank you. Love you so much, Grandma. Thank you for that. Thank you so much. I can't forget this, girls. I will never forget this. Well, you look good. This is going to be over. And then we're going to get back to life as normal and we're going to have fun. And then you can spend more time with me. I know I am your favorite. I know you don't want to say that because you have Maria there. But we'll get to spend time together uh, and we'll look back at this and we'll say that we're the better for it, right? 
That's right. right. That's it's time for everything, Andrew. All right. Well, you have fun there. Anything you need? Is Maria taking no, good I'm care of you? You sure Maria's taking good care of you? I have your sister Maria here, and I have beautiful granddaughters here as well. So I, I'm in good company. And, and all the children, all my grandchildren. I, I am so blessed, as many mothers today are. And I, I just thank you so much for everything you do, Andrew, to make families really better than ever. Thank you. All right. You have a beautiful day. I'll see you soon. I know you want to see me because I, I, know I know I'm your favorite deep down inside, but you don't want to say it. I love you, honey. I'll talk to you later. I love you, Grandma. Thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you. Questions? Thank you. Why is the state not testing all nursing home residents? We are testing nursing home residents. Or mass testing everyone. We are mass testing as many as we can. And what would the state have done in early March if hundreds of nursing homes said that they can't care for their patients with this very contagious, devastating, unknown disease? Um, did you have any overflow beds for them in early March? And uh, did you tell them the nursing homes about it in early March? Yeah, let's just uh, do this again. The nursing home must refer a per person if they can't provide the adequate care, period. That's the nursing home's obligation. If they cannot provide care for any reason, they don't even have to give a reason, by the way. I don't have staff, my staff is sick, I don't have PPE, I don't have isolation facilities, I don't have quarantine facilities, I don't have enough beds, I don't have enough pillowcases. It does not matter. If they can't provide care, they call the Department of Health, Department of Health sends them somewhere else. We have always had more beds than we have needed. Always had more beds than we have needed. And that is extraordinary because we had to create 40,000 beds. Uh, you know, people say, well, we created more beds than we need. Actually, they raise a criticism that we created more beds than we need, right? Federal government says uh, we created Javits, we brought up the uh, US Navy ship Comfort, we didn't even need it. Yeah, at the end of the day, we didn't need it. Thank God we didn't need it because we reduced the curve and we saved lives. But if we hadn't reduced the curve, we would have needed it. That's where the projections were. But that was true from day one. Yes. 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 And they should have done it by law. Governor, the court system is currently operating on a largely virtual function. Can you please comment on when new non-essential lawsuits are going to be able to be filed? Yeah, I don't know. Does anyone know when non-essential lawsuits will it's be something filed? that we're working with the courts on, and then the larger issue is around um, is around secrecy issues for when you can convene grand juries. And so we're working hand in glove with uh, Janet DeFiori and the courts on that. But the answer is we're trying to get online as soon as possible. Can you speak to when grand juries might fall into this reopening plan? It's something, it's something that we're looking at. We're looking at what other states are doing if there's a way to accommodate it virtually. But again, the issue is the secrecy laws that, that govern. And so we're working with the courts and we're trying to get online as soon as possible. Are there any concerns about you know bringing people if they will, they will actually show up for a jury considering yeah, this? That is the, yeah, that is exactly the concern, which is why we're looking into virtual options. But as I said, the secrecy laws that govern supersede that. And so we're trying to see what other states are doing, get creative, because we want the court system to be up and running as soon as possible. The govern grand juries. Grand jury secrecy. Reopening the courts is not an executive decision, or managing the courts is not an executive decision, right? That's a separate branch of government, the court system. The chief judge is in charge of that. We're working with the chief judge, following her recommendations, which have been extraordinary. Much of, uh, there's still a lot of work going done, even though the courts have been closed and their transition to remote services has been great. So we're working together, but the questions you raise are gonna be more to the discretion of uh, the judicial system. Why did the, it sounds like the state is rescinding the March 25th order regarding nursing homes. What went into the change of thinking in that? What, why do it now and not do it two weeks ago when people first started sounding the alarm on it? I don't know the March 25th. It's not yeah. rescinding the order. You still can't discriminate against the patient solely in a nursing home based on their COVID status. This is saying to hospitals now, if you have a COVID patient that you got for some reason acute care, needed or whatever, 
they should test positive before being discharged from the hospital itself. So, just, to, go ahead. just to clarify on that, so a hospital can't send a resident back to their nursing home if they still test positive for it. How is that different from March 24th? Because you're the only avenue of coming to a nursing home is not just the hospital. It could have been a new patient. It could have been from another facility besides the hospital. It does overrun the March 25th order, correct? You still cannot discriminate against a nursing home patient. What we're saying is if you're in a hospital for another reason, you can't discharge that patient until they're negative. The two orders coexist, Jesse. What we're saying is you still can't discriminate an entrance to a nursing home facility solely on the basis of being COVID positive or being suspected COVID positive. This puts the obligation on hospitals, which is saying a hospital cannot release a COVID positive patient into a nursing home facility until they test negative. What Jim is accurately saying is the only hospitals are not the only avenue into nursing homes. There are other ways in which people enter nursing homes. The fact still remains that you cannot discriminate based on COVID positive status. However, as the governor has said 17 times, you also, a nursing home cannot accept a patient if they cannot care for them. They have to be able to cohort the patients. There has to be segregated staff. You have to have the appropriate level of PPE. And if you cannot meet those standards, you cannot accept a patient. You call DOH, DOH finds a facility for them. Let's do it. No, let's do it the other way because it's, it's complicated. This is binding on a hospital, not on a nursing home. If you want to refer your mother who is COVID positive to a nursing home, the nursing home cannot say to you, I'm discriminating against your mother. I don't take COVID uh, positive people. That would be discrimination. The nursing home can say, look, I'm not equipped at this time to handle COVID patients uh, I refer you to the Department of Health to find a facility that can. But they can't discriminate on the basis of, of uh, COVID positive. A hospital uh, cannot discharge to a nursing home, and that is new, cannot discharge a person who is COVID positive to a nursing home. Uh, the hospital can discharge, they can either hold the COVID positive person or discharge them to one of our other facilities like our COVID positive facilities, et cetera. Uh, this will reduce the burden on nursing homes all across the board because they're not gonna get any COVID people from a hospital. But they could conceivably get it from a person on the street that wants to put their COVID positive if, big if, big if, if they can handle it. And that's what you never really communicated. Uh, and I don't think you've done the residents or the families a service, you generically. The nursing home, if they cannot take care of a person, I can't do COVID, I'm a nursing home operator, I can't take care of a COVID positive person. I don't have enough staff. I can't quarantine in my facilities. I don't have the PPE. It was their obligation to inform, and it is their obligation to call the Department of Health and say, you have to come get this person. I can't care for them. That has always been the case. Is this new policy though, something of a recognition, though, that the, the, the idea of sending COVID-positive people from hospitals back into nursing homes may have been flawed, that that may no. have been a mistake? No. First of all, the, if you look at the facts, which is always fun, the, you can test your hypothesis on what's flawed. Look at how many residents we have in nursing homes. Look at the percentage of our deaths in nursing homes vis-a-vis -vis other states, right? Uh, we're down by like number 34. So whatever we're doing has worked on the facts. Uh, second, well, uh, at one time, hospital beds were precious. When we started this, remember, the whole question was, will you have enough hospital beds? We were in a scramble to provide more hospital beds, right? Go from 50,000 to 40,000, 110,000. So the last thing you would be doing would be gratuitously saying, we're gonna keep a person in a hospital bed who doesn't need a hospital bed, 
who could be at another facility. You would never do that. It would be reckless, it would be negligent, because you needed the hospital bed so badly. What we're saying today is we have excess capacity all across the board. Uh, and the hospital can discharge to another one of our facilities. They don't have to discharge to the nursing home. They can discharge to any one of our facilities, which was always the case. And initially, it presumed the system, yes, a hospital could have, or initially a hospital could have discharged to a uh, nursing home or to one of our other facilities. Discharged to the nursing home, presuming they could handle it, and they said they could handle it. And if they couldn't handle the discharged person, they would have said, I can't take this person. Your premise is they were accepting people who legally they shouldn't have accepted. That's what you would have to say. No, I guess my point is optically, if you've used the metaphor of dry grass, right? So optically, to put a COVID positive person who is a tinder, if you excuse the metaphor, into dry grass from a hospital into a nursing home where there are, is this kind of vulnerable population base, the optics on that seem illogical. If, well, if they have positive, well, if you're right, and a per that facility did not have the accommodations to accept that person and isolate them and quarantine them, which is what they're supposed to do, they don't put the piece of tinder in the dry grass, you're at the other end of the facility in an isolated quarantine situation, like you are, by the way, in every other facility, when you go into a hospital, you think the hospital has just COVID people? No, the hospital has, is also tinder and dry grass, right? You have all sorts of people in a hospital. So you have to treat that person without infecting other people. That's what you're doing in a hospital system. That's what you're doing in any facility that has mixed populations. That's what you'd have to do in a nursing home. And if you can't do it, you say, I can't do it. And that was it. End of discussion. You say, I can't do it. You don't get the patient discharged to you. Issue. On, on the issue of these Kawasaki-like deaths, um, can we get any more details on the victims themselves? I mean, obviously, this must be deeply upsetting and deeply concerning to parents. Uh, do we have ages? Do we have regions? Do we have pre-existing The question is what we can give you without violating the health of law, and I'll ask Dr. Zucker, but you're right. And the reason why we are spending so much attention to it, uh, taking so much time on it, yeah, this is... You want to talk about Mother's Day. This is every mother's nightmare. This is every parent's nightmare. Uh, we, no one knew about it. Nobody was watching for it. You know, it's the same story of this virus from day one. The virus has been ahead of us every step of the way. And we've been playing catch up every step of the way. We played, it was ahead of us when it was coming here from Europe and nobody told us. Uh, and now we thought that it wasn't affecting children, and now we find out it may be affecting children. That's why we're notifying all the other states. Uh, we've notified the CDC. We're watching it for the CDC. The CDC will communicate. Um, but nobody knows that it wasn't here and just not diagnosed because it doesn't look like a COVID case. But, Howard, is there anything else we can say? So. As the governor mentioned, there are 85, there are 85 um, uh, children that we're evaluating. I have a team of over 30, to, uh, around 30 to 40 people who are looking at the charts of all of those uh, patients uh, to assess uh, exactly what has happened to them. We do know about the ages of those who have, have died, as the governor mentioned, two are in the elementary school age and one was uh, an adolescent uh, in three different counties. We'll have more information. I'm always careful about what I share because of the privacy issues, as the governor mentioned. Um, we are evaluating those charts as a pediatric cardiologist myself. I personally have looked over the chart of the child that died, the five-year-old that we spoke about, uh, and the other two I will look over as well, as well as other charts um, there. This is something which, as the governor mentioned, we weren't looking for this because these children did not present with respiratory illnesses. So all of a sudden, we hear about children with cardiac problems, inflammation of their blood vessels. We try to figure out what is happening here. 
So the CDC has sent people up as well. Uh, we have a whole team investigating all these charts, and we're going to find and get to the bottom of it, come up with what are the criteria, and provide that to, to the rest of the states in the United States. Conditions, or were these healthy children that died? Well, of the, like I said, there are 85 charts, and we're looking through, through those. Of the other ones uh, right now, no, the three that, that had died uh, did not that we've heard about. But we will, this is why we need to investigate all this, and this is why we have over 30 people looking yeah, at those charts. Sorry, just one more. <clears throat> is there anything you can say to parents? I mean, the, the symptoms of this appear to be somewhat commonplace, swollen extremities, swollen tongue, so, rashes. Right. Uh, how, how, how do you differentiate kind of a, a common fever or something like that from something, something more serious? Right. And this, this is very heartbreaking because it's kids, and, uh, and obviously we, we worry about uh, children who have vague symptoms. They present with nausea, vomiting. Uh, but I think what I would tell parents, if I was wearing my other hat, I would tell parents that if your child has any nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, pallor, uh, your color of your face changing, the color of their lips and, and, and fingers, if they have any chest pains, if they're older and they can complain about that, uh, they should call their doctor and, and they need to be evaluated. Um, I, I think that once we look at these other, these 85 charts and, and we get more information, we'll have more answers for you about this, but right now the, the the most important thing parents should do is err on the side of caution. Yeah, but just, and Jesse, you're, you are right. And this is a delicate uh, balance here, right? Because the symptoms that we suggested people look for are very broad. Uh, and you're talking about young children who come up with a lot of symptoms all the time, it seems like. The common denominator is, had the coronavirus antibodies or are positive for coronavirus, right? That's the common denominator here. You would not know that without the virus test. Uh, now, we don't want to create a situation where a child gets a rash and every parent uh, gets nervous that they think their child needs a uh, coronavirus test. That's why as much information as we can get from these investigations as quickly as we can get it, um, because I understand leaving the question mark hanging out there makes people nervous. At the same time, we want the other states to know what we know, and we want the CDC to know what we know. Um, but I think Dr. Zucker's advice is good. You don't overreact. Uh, if you think your child may have been uh, exposed to the coronavirus and there are those symptoms, well, you know, that might be a different situation. Friday. Two elementary school and one adolescent death at this point. Thank you. Friday, New York City released the summons data. Just take one more. Anyone who didn't ask a question? Governor, on May 15th date on Monday, you had said no region had met the standard to reopen. Are there any updates today of any regions met the standards to reopen? Tomorrow, we're going to invite all the county executives, local officials, uh, to participate in the briefing. We'll be going through it uh, explicitly. But short answer is yes, there will be regions that are eligible on the 15th. Is that right, Jim? That's correct. Are you going to split the regions at all? Like maybe take Duchess out of the Westchester area? I think if you look at, uh, Jim can talk to you about this afterwards, but I think if we took uh, Rockland, Westchester out of the region, the region still wouldn't qualify because the Duchess numbers themselves don't qualify. But Jim can give you more information. Thank you, guys. Happy Mother's Day to everyone. Happy Mother's Day.